Welcome back, everyone. This is Kevin Wallace, and this is Tissue to Bullseye Strategy number three. This one is something I call abort. And again, I've got a spoiler alert for you. I'm going to be walking through one of the trouble tickets presented in Cisco's T-Shoot demo out on their website for the T-Shoot exam. So if you want to go through these trouble tickets first, please do that before you see me reveal one of the answers. But I want to use one of these trouble tickets, actually a couple of these trouble tickets, to demonstrate the abort approach. Let's take a look at trouble ticket number one. Trouble ticket number one reads that we've got a client, client one, that is unable to ping a web server out on the internet, which, by the way, is the same trouble ticket that we had in our previous demonstration when we were taking a look at T-Shoot Bullseye Strategy number two. And you might recall that that issue stemmed from an incorrect interface being specified in a static route. But even though we have the same trouble ticket, we're probably going to have a different issue this time. Let's get started in the troubleshooting. We might start by going to our Layer 3 topology, and just as before, we can begin by following the path. We can start by determining if we have an IP address assigned to this client. Let's do an IP config. We do, and then we can start pinging, or you could do a trace route if you prefer. I'm going to do a ping. We could start pinging our default interface and then every interface after that. Can I ping my default interface, or my default router, I should say? Let's do a ping to 172.16.2.1. I can get to my default gateway. Can I get to the interface on the other side of my default gateway? 172.16.1.14. And I cannot. This suggests that I might need to do some troubleshooting over on that device, over on DSW-1. So let's go over to DSW-1 and uh, see what's happening. Let's do a show IP route to see if we know about any routes beyond DSW-1. And look at that. No, we don't. All we know about is a directly connected route. We know about the route that points over to the clients. We don't seem to know about a route that points over to R4. Well, that's interesting. We can see from our topology that it's EIGRP that we're using, EIGRP Autonomous System 16 specifically. Let's take a look at our running configuration. And let's check out the EIGRP configuration to see if anything might be going on there. Let's scroll down. And we've got router EIGRP 16, so the autonomous system looks correct. We've got a couple of network statements, one for the two networks to which DSW-1 is attached. Are we going to be a little bit concerned about the fact that this network is using a 30-bit subnet mask and we're specifying a 24-bit subnet mask? Mm, we might keep that in the back of our mind. A passive interface is set to the default behavior. We're saying that we're not going to be sending out EIGRP advertisements, but we're saying we're making an exception. That exception is fast ethernet 1 slash 0 slash 1. Let's see, what is that interface? Let's do a show run. 1 slash 0 slash 1. That's the interface that gets us over to R4, so it's good that we're making the passive interface exception there. It does appear to have the right IP address. Let's go over to router R4 right now. And on router R4, let's do a show IP route. And R4 does have EIGRP learned routes. However, it doesn't seem to know about the 172.16.2.0/24 network. In fact, it doesn't even know about this directly attached network. Let's take a look at its EIGRP configuration. Let's do a show run. And it is also configured for EIGRP Autonomous System 16. We've got Auto Summary turned on here. We didn't have Auto Summary turned on on DSW-1. And we've got a single network statement. But that single network statement, it encompasses both of the networks to which we are attached. So is this a problem or not? Now at this point in our troubleshooting, we've isolated the issue. We're thinking it's probably something on R4 or maybe DSW-1. It's right in that area of the network where communication stops. However, perhaps we're not quite sure what's going on. We might suspect it has something to do with EIGRP. We might suspect it has something to do with the auto summary command or the, the passive interface command on DSW-1, but we're just not sure. And while we should be able to logically think through it, and if we did, we would realize that that configuration really is okay, but sometimes under the time pressure of the exam, we might be suspecting that that could be an issue. Here's a way to do a bit of a sanity check. I call it abort. 
here's what you can do. If you go back to your question, if you go back to your question number one in this case, you can click on abort. You want to abort ticket number one. And you get this message saying, alert, are you sure all your changes are going to be lost? Well, you really haven't made many changes, have you? I mean, at most, you've selected what device you suspect, what technology, and you may have looked through and hypothesized about one of the fixes to this issue, but it's only a handful of things. It's not like there's a bunch of configuration that's going to go away if you abort. It's a pretty safe thing to abort. I'm going to say, yes, I want to abort this ticket. Here's the reason I want to abort this ticket, because the base configuration in all of these trouble tickets is identical. It's just that the problem moves a little bit. So if I click on trouble ticket two right now, and minimize trouble ticket two. Even though it looks like I'm still in the same console interface, I'm still connected to R4, I'm still connected to DSW1, if I give the show run command again, it's going to be different. I'm going to get different output if anything indeed has changed from trouble ticket number one. Let's do a show run. Now that I'm in trouble ticket number two, let's take a look at our EIGRP configuration. And it's identical to trouble ticket one. So there's nothing wrong here. Let's go back to DSW1 and let's do a show run. And let's look at its EIGRP configuration. And it's identical. There's nothing wrong with its EIGRP configuration. So if we were about to make a guess that it was EIGRP related on one of these routers, that would have been incorrect. Now that we know it's not EIGRP because we looked at a different ticket, and it has an identical EIGRP configuration, now we're ready to abort trouble ticket number two, go back to trouble ticket number one, and start looking deeper. Let's go back to DSW1 now that we know it's not EIGRP, and let's, as the next step, see if we can ping our neighbor. We haven't established an EIGRP neighborship with it, but can we ping it? Let's try. Let's scroll over to where we can see the IP address. It's going to be one seventy two dot sixteen dot one dot thirteen. No, we don't have connectivity at layer three apparently over to our neighboring router of R four. Let's see if that interface is even up. I mean it's one thing not to form an EIGRP neighborship, but I cannot even ping somebody that's directly attached to me. That's a concern. Let's do a show IP interface brief and if we take a look at the interface that gets us over there look at this we're down at layer one and we're down at layer two we're in a down down state now we're not administratively down on dsw1 we would be told if we were that's interesting let's go check out r4 let's see what's going on on r4's link if we do a show ip interface brief we see that the link that gets us back over to dsw1 ah it is administratively down that's suspect. Let's take a look at our running config. Let's take a look at fast ethernet 0 slash 0. The link to DSW1 is administratively shut down. I think this is the issue. And again, if we just wanted to verify that with the abort process, I'm pretty sure this is it, but we could try it. We could say abort, go to trouble ticket 2, then go back to R4, do a show run, take a look at that interface, and look, it's not shut down in this case. That's our delta. That's what's different. So now with confidence, we can go back and we can abort trouble ticket two. We can go back to trouble ticket one, and we can say with confidence that the fault is located on R4. And we'll say next question. It has to do with the interface status. Next question. And we need to go into fast ethernet zero slash zero and enter no shutdown to bring it back up and we'll say that we are done with that question and it tells us we have answered three out of the three questions for this ticket correctly so we got that one right again i wanted to show you how we could be misled by some of the interesting configuration that you might find on the exam in fact i was talking to the guy that wrote the exam with cisco and he told me that i could share this so i'm not breaking any non-disclosure agreements he said that he shared this at the cisco live convention last year so he said that i could share this he was saying that on the exam he might do something like this he gave me the example of ospf he said that in router ospf configuration mode 
he might have not put in a network statement for an interface that needed to participate in OSPF because there's more than one way to make an interface participate in OSPF. You could do it with a network statement under the router OSPF configuration or you could do it under interface configuration mode. And he said he very well may do something like that on the exam where things are just configured differently. They'll still work, but it might not be your normal configuration. We may vary our approach to configuration from one router to the other. And we saw a little bit of that here, didn't we? One router was using auto summarization for EIGRP. One router was not using auto summarization. It might make us think that it has something to do with that, even though it really didn't. That's where this abort process can really help us out. It gives us a quick sanity check. And this is not just a trick for the exam. This is applicable to the real world, because in the real world, you should have baseline information about how things should look when they're working properly. And you can compare your suspected faulty configuration against your baseline configuration. And again, look for what's changed. Look for the delta. Well, guys, that's going to wrap up our third of three T-Shoot Bullseye troubleshooting strategies. I hope it's been helpful to you. And all the best in your T-Shoot exam.